Hello and good day to everyone joining us. My name is Kelly and I'm leading the panel discussion. Today we're going to be talking about how HR tech helps with the challenges of the post-pandemic world. I said my name is Kelly. You can find me at kelly.lovin at lanteria.net. Uh, I work with Lanteria, which is a HR software company. Uh, we work on SharePoint and are optimized for Office 365. We were founded in 2006. So we have over 14 years of experience in the HR, for, in the HR world. We have over 200,000 users around the globe in over 40 different countries. We have 250 plus companies that use Anterior HR today. Some of those companies you will recognize, we work with Warner Brothers, with Lufthansa, with Sega, and many other companies that um, have had a lot of success going um, virtual with HR. Our platform consists of five different modules that help with all aspects of HR needs. Uh, we're designed with best HR best practices in mind. We are mobile, um, designed for employee self-service and mobile management. We have seamless integration with Office 365 and tons of other apps. Uh, we have advanced data security. And we're available both on SaaS and on-premise um, availability. Today we'll have three experts joining us from all over the globe. Um, start with ML Karu. She's the founder of One Circle. It's an online community of HR experts that are available for projects on demand. And Emma, would you like to introduce yourself and say a few words? Sure. Thanks a lot, uh, Kelly. Thank you for having me. And and uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, so yeah, I'm Emma, and I'm the founder of One Circle, OneCircleHR.com, uh, and we are an online platform that connects businesses directly with. Uh, freelance HR consultants from all around the world in a completely virtual collaborative work environment and um, and then yes we just we went live right before the coronavirus took the world by a storm uh, so it's one of those stories uh, but we are we are lucky because we are uh, gathering a lot of momentum uh, given um, the need of businesses today to, to transform uh, the way that they've been working for years, right? So, and now they're reaching out to consultants who can help them out, but as well, who can help them out at a, uh, at, at, at a um, open sourced uh, price that doesn't break the bank. So yeah, that's a bit about me. I'm originally Lebanese, um, uh, lived and worked most of my life in, in Dubai and in the Middle East, uh, now living in South Africa, and I'm the founder of One Circle. You truly have made one circle around the globe, it seems. Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for being with us here today. Thanks, Kelly. Our next panelist is Al Adamson. He's the founder of Pafal, um, another global network that we're excited to hear about. And Al, do you, would you like to introduce yourself and say a few words? Sure, uh, th thanks for having me here. And first off, Emma, uh, great to uh, yeah, see you and, and talk with you. I just wanna, you know, my heart goes out to you and your country people, uh, what happened uh, the other you. day. So definitely top of mind. Um, so with that, I am the founder and executive director CEO of the People Analytics and Future of Work Community and Conference Series. Um, we're at pafal.net. We're also active on Instagram and, and Twitter. Um, our core is around building community and promoting the ethical and responsible use of people data analytics for the benefit of individuals, groups, teams, organizations and society at large. And we do that through a host of experiences. So we're gonna have an online conference uh, 
October 5th and 6th, if I might just plug that in, then we're going to have uh, ongoing events on what we're now calling the Pathal Campus, which is a virtual environment that will be coming online in the coming weeks. So very excited to engage in this discussion and enter this uh, new world of work, uh, which is obviously highly virtual. So thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. And our next panelist, William, he will be joining us a little bit late today. Uh, he had another engagement that's running a little over. Um, but William, we're really excited to have. He is an influencer, speaker, advisor, consultant, storyteller, teacher. Uh, he's written tons of articles, many that we refer to. And he's a great person to uh, kind of bridge the gap between HR and technology and share some of his experience uh, with us when he joins in just a few minutes. And I'll yeah. echo that and I'm sure he'll sneak in here unnoticed. <laughs> I don't know about unnoticed. Yeah. He yeah. might try. We will notice. <laughs> uh, so I'm very much looking forward to today's discussion um, and really just thank everybody for making time uh, and their busy, busy schedules to be here with us to talk about how we are using HR technology post pandemic. So I think everybody uh, is now accepted the fact that everything has changed. We've had to move entire companies virtual. Um, you know, some have done better with the transition, some than others. Um, and, and so really today, some of the things that we want to talk about um, are how you create that collaborative environment in a virtual setting or even just post pandemic for those who have gone back. Um, how do we work with the data that we're getting now, the people data? Uh, how do we consider things like well-being um, and diversity and inclusion? The pandemic isn't the only thing happening in the world right now. Uh, diversity and, and inclusion and race relations are, um, are extremely important topics that all employers must consider at this point. And then, of course, we will also talk about um, establishing more of a pay for, 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 for huh, establishing a pay for performance module as opposed to um, some of the more traditional compensation things that we've had in the past. So are you all ready to get started? Yes, go. for sure. Yeah. Emma, when I see collaboration, I automatically um, want to go to you <laughs> and see if you have anything to, to jump on with that. Um, in your experience, That's like yeah, that's my favorite topic. Yeah, you know that. <laughs> but it's, it's, look, it's funny because we're, we're all in this together, right? And, and all, all of the businesses that were earlier resisting the idea of remote work and virtual work and flexible in, in whichever way or form, um, suddenly today they are all working remotely. So the whole idea of collaboration became around sending emails and text messages and WhatsApps and then connecting on, on, on any of those virtual tools, whether Zoom or any one of the other ones. But uh, we, we, we forget that this is, this is not natural. So collaborating and working, when you're collaborating with somebody and you're working with somebody, you are, you're using all of your senses, right? And, and there, when you are collaborating virtually, there are a couple of senses that you don't, you don't use. You, are, you can't touch the other person. You can't smell the other person. And, and I've been speaking to a, uh, um, a neuroscientist actually recently. And one of the things that she was talking about is that, uh, 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 that our brains, are continuously trying to readjust to the idea that you are working virtually, so you are facing a screen. And then all of those pixels and stuff that happen in the background, they are, they subconsciously are telling your brain that this is not real person, that's just a virtual person. But you are making a conscious effort all the time to readjust that I am talking to somebody who is real. And that's at the heart of collaboration, right? Because you, you, you get a sense and a feel uh, of, of, of the other person. There's, you, you, can't, you can't read their 
body language when you are discussing with them. So you can't basically know whether they are agreeing with you, disagreeing with you, not happy, should, should, should you cut this particular point short and carry on, etc. So there's a lot that is happening in the background. And, and there was a, a, a Harvard Business Review, I think, uh, a study that, that mentioned uh, that, that when you're talking collaborative environments and, and remotely, uh, you are talking about three types of distances. One which is the physical, which is very obvious uh, because you are in a completely different place and sometimes in a completely different time zone as well. The other one which is operational. So you're alone, whereas there are like three or five or 10 people on the screen, but you are not with them. Uh, you are connecting with different people with different skill levels, etc. But the third one, which is the most important one, which is affinity and it's related to the values and to the trust so um and 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 that particular study said that for companies to actually improve performance uh while collaborating remotely you need to ensure that you reduce the affinity distance which means in different words that you need to ensure that you increase the level of trust and alignment with your values. So when we're talking collaborative uh, remote uh, work or collaborative re uh, environment remotely, there's a lot of focus that needs to be on culture and on values and on building trust. And this is where you will get the most out of your people. There was another study, I took note of it here, that um, uh, for 1,100 companies that embraced collaborative working, they were five times more productive and, more, and, and higher performing than other companies. So, which means that instead of just switching to remote, they've actually, they've intentionally built a collaborative way of working while working remotely, which means they built trust, they've uh, 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 um, focused on their values, uh, they focus on their culture, and in this manner, their performance increased five times more than the other companies. Um, so, so, so yeah, when we, when we talk about that, we talk about technology, et cetera, et cetera, but then we should never forget that element. We need to be intentional to ensure that we are taking care of that bit. Yeah, if I might jump in, Emma, I mean, that's fantastic. I, I just, your words and voice are even more compelling than your written word, which is fantastic as well. So thanks for sharing. Uh, just to build off that, a couple things jumped to mind. Uh, and I'm going to fall short on citing the researcher, but I know he's out of UCLA and I know it's a him. That's all I got right now. But he did a study and in interpersonal interaction, uh, there's three uh, constructs that are weighted. Um, number one, uh, body language, tone, and the content of what is shared. And in his research, the number one influencer was body language, including facial expression. Number two was tone. Number three was content. In other words, it was 60, 30, 10, by the way. That's so wow. way weighted to body wow. language and, and facial expression and then tone because we have limited capacity cognitively to take in all this information, but we remember how we felt. So in this virtual situation, are we attentive to putting on our screens and attentive to our body language, our posture, our tone? Are we inclusive? Are we critical? And things like that. So just being mindful of that, building off what you were sharing, Emma, long ago as a management consultant with Ernst & Young, I was coached on people are going to want to work with you for four reasons. Number one, because they like you. And likability might seem trite, but it's really rooted in respect, uh, affirmative inquiry, growth mindset, th those types of constructs. Number two, they're going to uh, work with you because they trust you. Um, they trust your professional competence. They trust that you are curious and that you're going to come in and be a, a good worker, a, a good collaborator and so forth, which relates to number three. 
that they're going to have confidence that you understand their problem. And that is only going to come from, again, this curiosity and you know, growth mindset. And finally, they're going to be very, very clear on how you can help. And that is going to require a level of advocacy. Hey, I can do that. I understand this problem. I can come help. And it's not rooted in bravado. It's rooted in authentic uh, confidence. So, you know, again, likability, trust, understanding the problem, and communicating, you know, how you can help. Now, all fine and good. How do you do that in a virtual setting? And the final thing I'll say is that I 100% agree with Emma that we are physical human beings. We want to see each other in three dimensions. We use our smell, use our touch, use our, you know, that's where human beings connect. That's what we do. We're tribal beings and that's great. Right now we're looking at these two dimensional glowing rectangles as one of my friends likes to say and it dehumanizes again uh, to amplify what Emma was saying. So how do we combat that? Sometimes I'm now taking phone calls as opposed to asking somebody to stare at this glowing rectangle. And I appreciate the irony on that we're on a webinar right now. Uh, but at the same time, giving our eyes a rest, um, asking somebody, hey, go for a walk. You know, when you get to, you know, the hill or wherever, you know, let's talk then. So you're in a different mind space. So appreciating the diversity of experiences that lead to your frame of mind that uh, leads to your openness to new ideas, your openness to create, your openness to truly uh, advocate um, uh, appropriately. Because uh, if we're in the same space for eight, nine plus hours a day, because there's research out there that shows that we're working longer. And if yes. we have kids run around the background and all that, that is a big ass. So we have to mix it up. We have to stand up. We have to do other things. So I'll pause there. Collaboration is this issue is not going to get solved, uh, you know, right away. It, to Emma's point, it's going to take practice, and we have to be patient with ourselves. We have to be patient with our colleagues, but we do have to change. I mean, that's just the reality of the world. Yeah, it's a. Uh... That's amazing. So I, uh, I've actually spoke about this um, uh, a couple of months ago. I started practicing a 90-20 um, uh, way of working. <laughs> so I, I work for, for 90 minutes and then I take uh, uh, 20 minutes of break to do anything, whatever. I can't manage to sneak in the cooking in 20 minutes. <laughs> but, 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 you know, you, you get your mind to relax, to wander, to because you're, you're, you're in on your screen the whole time. And even when you are connecting with other people, we do this mistake of just scheduling things back to back. Mm -hmm. um, but working as part of a team uh, and, and that, that shift from working in an office space to building an online community with shared values and with trust, it's not easy. And uh, it requires um, uh, it, it requires interventions, and those interventions could be uh, maybe just scheduling time to talk, coffee, connect as as to do whatever, speak not about work, uh, but but schedule those as uh, so. There's a lot of tips that are out there. That Kelly brings me back to an earlier discussion that you and I had about collaborative environments and building trust between strangers and building communities, but not within teams that are working as in, in a business or as an organization, but something to similar to One Circle, for example, where we are building a community of HR consultants who want to work independently and want to work on exciting projects like LinkedIn. It's a community, right? I've met all of you over LinkedIn. We have spoke, we chatted. We know a lot about each other. We don't even need to introduce ourselves to each other anymore. So this, and, and this is by itself a collaborative environment. Some of them are formal, some of them are informal. If you like surfing, you join a surfing community. And then suddenly they become the experts that are guiding you on surfing. <laughs> how to surf, what to, what to do, what, what's the best weather, et cetera. Um, I'm, I'm not a surf, surf, surfing fan, but my partner is. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> right. uh, yeah, so, so this, uh, those um, virtual communities 
they create a collaborative environment. The best thing about it, and, and this would lead you onto the second point, but the best thing about it is you start building that level of trust and, and you start learning from the others. So it, it creates that, it breaks the barrier. So whenever I wanna, I, 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 I know you're an expert at something and I need guidance, I just go to you directly online and I ask you for help, right? And, and, and that's the best, best, best thing ever because it, be, it becomes from a collaborative environment to building a full ecosystem around you that is supporting you. And it becomes your support system. Yeah. Then you, then you go to people data. <laughs> that's a different story. Yeah. You mind if I jump in, Emma? I, I have yes, a, you got so, it. so I, I, yeah, again, I love what you're saying. And I also, I'm really curious about Dunbar's number. Dunbar's number, for those who don't know, is 150. And that represents the number of meaningful relationships an individual can have at any point in time. Now, that was obviously pre-COVID, and that number has a lot of qualifications associated with it. Mm -hmm. And there is now research emerging around those uh, who have wide networks, such as myself, what is too wide? Is there a diminishing return to width or breadth uh, of network when you have people reaching out that frankly, you, sometimes you just cannot get to. It makes me feel bad. It makes the other individual feel bad. So taking it away from the personal and making it more broad, our individual capacity in a work from home environment is being taxed, um, particularly those who have families with young kids. Uh, they're sometimes working more, yet they have other responsibilities, they have other distractions, and it's adversely affecting their well being. So, how then do we honor the individual's uh, reality while also enabling them to get work done? So, as we have these networks built, which I 100% agree with Emma, it's fabulous. I would love to find uh, people, to, I, I would encourage people to set boundaries. And I would love as we go into the future to provide digital mechanisms to share availability on certain you know, either topics or, or asks. Um, it's just a lot of people are feeling overwhelmed right now. And it, there is a diminishing um, uh, terms of collaboration, in my view, it just it then invites the question, how do we manage it? So for now, I think a key takeaway is just be mindful of it, um, your own capacity and other people's capacity. But the need to do this is not going to go away. And you know, again, I want to amplify if we can harness the uh, wisdom of different individuals who are in fact experts at these certain dimensions is going to save them time because on the other side. I feel really appreciated when I feel seen for having expertise. I feel, okay, you know, someone values me and re respects me. So that is really, really cool. It's just, you know, when that outreach happens, whether it be a, in an organization or external, I want to be able to respond and I yes. want other people to be able to engage and respond as well. So tricky challenge. Yeah. I think something you both have, have mentioned is, um, and, and thank you, by the way, for addressing that people are working more, both of you. Because one thing that we hear over and over is, what are you gonna do with all this extra time now that you're working from home? And so thank you for challenging that there actually is less extra time. Um, but one thing you all, you all both talk about or have briefly mentioned is the authenticity and sincerity in it. So I think both to the point that you're making, Emma, about the collaborative environment and um, building trust and relating on those values, but then also what you're saying, Al, to not extend, not overextending your network so that you can still give sincere answers. Um, and then that's a topic, I think, authenticity and, and sincerity and, and communication and in, in the virtual world, it seems to be gaining a lot of traction. Yeah, there is. I actually read on that point. I re I read something, but I, I forgot which company. But one of the companies allow um, their teams and and at that company level um, to come up with acronyms, 
that they put in along with their um, in their emails or their messages or whatever. And one example that stood out for me is no need to respond. So N N T R, like you you write the email, but in the subject, and then you put the subject, and then and 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 no need to respond. N N T R. So it's basically I'm just sending it to you. It's like when we say F Y I. But this mm -hmm. is more like, it's okay, don't stress. <laughs> you can read it at your ease. And then um, another one that was funny is four HR, so four hours. So you need to respond within four hours. Uh, oh. and, and this is this is where, you know, us as humans, we start adjusting and readjusting to, 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 to this new way of living and working and where the lines are blur. And, and funny enough that FYI became an NTR. So it's, um, but it's actually, it means the same thing, you know, that I'm just sending it to you so you will know about it. And instead of putting a timeline, uh, please get back to me as soon as possible. Then now it became 4HR. <laughs> but it's all about respecting time and respecting capacity because we can, we can only extend and stretch ourselves that much. And, and yes, um, it, it was actually Microsoft where they, they, they said that they are working for hours more. And I'm sure most companies are as well because that fine line between, between your personal and your work becomes very blurry. Uh, and, <laughs> and the requests keep on coming and, 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 and psychologically you feel under pressure to respond same way when you get a message you get 100 messages from your linkedin network and you think i, I really need to respond because i it makes me it makes me feel good that i'm actually building this connection and i'm i'm, I'm giving back if somebody asks me for my opinion but but you are under pressure it is putting you under pressure yeah, I, just to build off that, it, it is, and the good news is we have now systems that are elevating the awareness that there is more pressure. And, and just to uh, build off the Microsoft example, Carly Scott Murphy has presented at our profile conferences in the past. She is based in Melbourne, Australia, and works on the workplace analytics solution. And she is one of those who shared uh, that there are more frequent, uh, I'm sorry, there are more meetings per day. Uh, they're of shorter duration. Uh, however, the, the work, it, the digital work that is uh, present in the Office 365 suite is, it's high. And so, and they happen, that work happens at various times of the day. So if we juxtapose that over certain dimensions by location, job, family, um, diversity groups, or what have you, we're going to share and in, get insights that are likely actionable. Um, where I get really passionate about this, uh, given this uh, new age, is what I call capacity management. So, and aka workforce planning. So, we built our workforces based on a host of assumptions where people were coming into the workplace and they can get a certain amount of work done. They can contribute X. And now they're in the work home environment and they can only contribute Y. And the thing is not many organizations have understood the delta therefore they're asking people to act like they did formerly and thus they're getting burnt out they're getting stressed and frankly they're being asked to do things that they're not able to deliver on because they don't have the resources, everything from bandwidth to the fact that they have distractions uh, behind them. They have needs of taking care of their kids because they can't go back to school and, and things like that. So really understanding uh, the constraints um, mm -hmm. and say, okay, they can now only do why. Therefore, where we had a thousand people before, we need 1,200 people. And not many organizations have the gumption to come to that realization and act on it because given the state of the economy and in, in most industries, there's like, Oh no, we can't hire anybody. We need to just, you know, just, to, and I think there's a cost to that as I actually, I don't even think, I know there's a cost to that as well. So again, capacity management is something that's going to be really important moving forward. Microsoft workplace analytics um, sheds light on it. Solution Cassiopeia time is limited. So there's a host of solutions that are emerging that are really going to 
provide visibility into the stresses and capacity constraints that people are under, which is a good thing. Sounds like I got a, excited. A, I got excited. Sorry. Yeah. Well, we're talking. You know, if, if ethical use of data is your jam, then yeah. that's a really that's it. You know, exciting topic. Um, which could Absolutely. bring us right into our, our the next point that we that we wanted to, to discuss. Uh, uh, Emma or Al, was there anything else that you uh, wanted to add on on the first point there? Right, Emma, yeah. Emma, you go. You can go wherever you want because I, if I, my next uh, toggle is going to be more towards well being, uh, but I don't want to go there until uh, you're comfortable. Oh, okay. <laughs> so no worries. I um, I was just. Uh, we were actually having an internal discussion the last day is that, um, you know, with people online the whole time and they have to do everything online now, they, they're, they're, they're doing their shopping, they're, they're, they're buying apps, they're working, they are putting a lot of personal information out there. Um, and and how, how much of a data security is, is there and what us as individuals what training have we got to protect our own data basically and how can we tell whether this is this particular website that I'm using is compliant with data protection uh, and, and and so for us for example we we, we take people's uh, uh, data very seriously and we are very compliant but Still, we get a lot of consultants or companies that ask us, why are you asking me all of this personal information? And we like it when people ask us because this is the right thing to do. And, 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 and we, we explain to them that, especially in today's world, when you are connecting different types of people on, an, on a platform, you need to ensure that these people are real. <laughs> and uh, because you're taking this responsibility of, of um, connecting them on your tech platform. You want to make sure that they are read. You want to make sure that you've checked, that done your background check, etc. So, uh, and 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 people appreciate it when you explain that. But then again, when when I think about businesses today, how much of that education are they doing for their own people, for their own personal life? Um, I haven't seen much of that. So they give them the tools that the company uses. They restrict them on the on their own PCs and computers that they cannot do certain downloads, et cetera. But in my personal capacity as a mom, if I want to download an app for my daughter to keep her busy or to learn math online, uh, how much of knowledge do I have if I'm not a tech person? How much of knowledge do I have about this security that I'm putting out there or exposing my daughter and information about her on, on, on this particular app, right? So it becomes suddenly this, this, that subject was really important, but right now it is extremely important because everybody is online. Um, now on the flip side, and now this is something that I will, 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 will even get more excited about is that with all of this data, now we learn a lot about people's behavior. And when we learn a lot about people's behavior, we will be able to, in my opinion, basically, I, we will be able to make their life easier, right? Provide them with the exact tools that they need in order to make their life easier. We can go back exactly as you said, Al, you can go back to companies and tell them, look, we have realized that people's capacity actually is much lower when they are, and based on data, right, and analysis, when they are working virtually. And so, which means that they cannot chunk up the same volume of work that they've been doing before. And this is why you need to readjust. You can't, maybe, maybe, maybe it's about time people start thinking more about being project driven and, 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 and then, um, which is what, <laughs> what there are lots of tools out there but teaming up uh, uh, your teams uh, to complement each other from a level of skills and, 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 and innovation and, and freshness of thought in order to get the best out of project. And this is where independent 
consultants and contractors come into play. So, so there's a lot of data out there that is shared. At some point, when we start sifting through this data and, 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 and looking at it, hopefully we will, be, uh, we will have the objectivity and uh, to use it in the right, in the right way. And, uh, but this is gonna take time. So this is not something that is gonna happen straight away, unless if Microsoft, they have something under their sleeve. <laughs> <laughs> right, and, and build, just to build off that, uh, and, and just to be clear for those who are watching and, and listening, is these uh, four bullets, in my view, are not mutually exclusive. Uh, you know, collaborative environments create data, which then are, are used either responsibly for the benefit of the individual, which speaks to well-being, and obviously, you know, the way we are compensated and rewarded, um, you know, has to be. Uh, sometimes adjusted, uh, but it needs to be appreciated to a, a greater degree. Many companies have already said, well, I'm not paying for these offices anymore, therefore I'm gonna lower pay. They don't have commute, so therefore, you know, I'm gonna do uh, this. Um, is that fair? Uh, yeah, that's an open discussion. Uh, but I will <laughs> say is, is this, is we uh, have not, as organizations, had the governance bodies in place to ask and answer the questions Emma just put forth. In other words, what is the desired employee experience? What data do we need to answer uh, the questions that we want or need to know? Namely, you know, are people being asked to do much? Uh, are they resourced properly? The good news is many organizations put together these crisis management teams and have got together and said, okay, you know, what are we going to do to help our employees? Uh, many of those stories have gone really well and HR has played not only a critical role, but a lead role in many cases. And now we're in this kind of normalcy, particularly here in the U.S. where most states, oh, they're not going to return to school. So there's clarity that we're going to, okay, be in virtual only. Now employers are able to adjust. And you likely know that Google uh, came out and said, we're not going to come back to the workplace until July 2021 at the earliest. And so that provides everyone clarity and they can plan. So at the end of it, I do believe that we have to rethink our workforce strategy, our what I call work strategy. Um, and again, this is where I'll land this. It, and to build off Emma's point, historically in HR, we've thought all about employees. We got to hire people, we got to develop people, all employees. So increasingly, uh, if you look at 2008, 2009, the number of employees per revenue shrank. So by that metric, revenue per employee, things look good. <laughs> um, however, the work came back, people were doing a job and a half, two jobs just to stay on board. And similar dynamics are, are happening. What happened then is there was a greater reliance on contractors and outsource providers. And that is happening again, and I believe will continue to happen. We talk about the gig economy for the past 10 years. It's not going away. It's going to be part of a reality. So as organizational leaders, are we actually building processes to understand, okay, employers are going to do this work. Consultants are going to do this work. This is how we're going to allocate our budget. We're actually going to automate this. We're going to work with a startup or scale up over here. We're going to outsource this. So that systematic thinking is not evolved. It's not part of the normal way of being in organizations yet. I believe we're going to start, uh, I shouldn't say start, we've already started towards that end. In some cases, it's been a conscious move. In other cases, it's just people are scrambling and that's what's happening, but they haven't got their, their arms around it. So, you know, I hope, frankly, it moves to where, okay, we're going to have these formerly disparate functions get in a room or online like this and say, hey, you know, what work needs to be done to achieve these outcomes? What's our constraints budget wise? You know, what resources do we have? Let's go and design the ideal future state or uh, uh, ideal way forward and then iterate as we go. So that's what I hope. Um, that's what I'm advocating. But I, you know, frankly, I think we're a two or three uh, on the 10 point scale, 10 being great. Um, I think we, in other words, we have a long ways to go. From an HR software perspective, that's really 
where we've seen the, um, the companies who have handled the transition very well, they kind of started out with like, okay, what is the basics that we need? What do we got? And then exactly what you all said, restructuring the roles, the, um, the workload of people, and uh, many of them went to a, a project-based compensation model, even if just for some of their employees. Um, so that's a lot of, of what we've seen is just the people um, who are kind of moving and being fluid through that transition, but willing to not be so rigid and this is how we've done it, this is how we have to do it, this job role demands these things, and so we have to have to keep doing that. Um, it, it's just not that way anymore. I think project basis and, and um, just redefining what yeah. the workload and the, and the roles are has been, has been the key to success for a lot of folks. So. Agreed. Um, and um, since since we haven't heard yet from William, I think we should just keep moving along. Um, we'll no, we should stop. We should stop and we mourn his <laughs> his ad. No, just <laughs> no. Well, we are mourning. I'm mourning. I was very looking forward to. It. Hopefully, he'll still pop in. I just am very excited to talk about this third point. Um, and uh, but Al, you've already mentioned that you are that you are very much looking forward to jumping in on the well-being, diversity, and inclusion bit. Yeah, I'll, I'll just do this real quick then just to tee up Emma because I, I, I know she has uh, comments on this. I'll just say that we, um, a lot of talk around well-being, but to actually put it into practice is another thing. I think we have to, you know, engagement's still been talked about, even paper performance. What the heck does performance mean? Uh, you know, defining these using more natural language. I mean, are you okay? is a damn good question to be asking right now. And what can I do to help is another good question. And then it invites, you know, are we prepared to take appropriate action based on what we learn? Um, it, when people, in my view, after the basics, people want three things. They want to be seen, they want to be heard, and they want to be empowered. In other words, they don't want to be invisible. They want to be ignored. And oftentimes they don't want to be told what to do like a child. They want to you know, apply their creativity and be resourced to do great things. So how can we do that in this virtual remote uh, reality that we're delivering? That takes creativity. If I had a dollar for every time I've been asked, well, you know, what's the leading practice? What's Google doing? What's, I mean, like, you're going to have to create what's appropriate for your organization at this point in time. In other words, you got to do the work. You can't just download a PDF and you know go forward. You have to actually have the collaboration, have the exploration, get uncomfortable, you know, create new processes, create new data, create new analyses, uh, and not many want to do it. Uh, they haven't prioritized it, and I think that is adversely affecting individual well-being and organizational performance. So anyway, you got me on my soapbox, got me all fired up. <laughs> That's what we're here for. Yeah. We are here to listen to your soapbox. <laughs> yeah. uh, Emma, I'll toss it over yeah. to you. Hi, thank you. I like that. I um, actually um, had a chat with Anne Betts. She's a neuroscientist. Mm -hmm. And Anne uh, mentioned something that is, that is amazing is that businesses today need to connect with the human being and not the human doing. Mm. And that's exactly what you are saying is that how many leaders today or, or managers or, you know, team leaders, they just ask their people if, if they're doing okay, if they're managing okay, etc. And, 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 and when you talk leadership today, this is very important because you, 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 we're all in this together, right? You can't like expect them to address. And, and it impacts the well-being. Uh, this is where we start talking about, okay, so what about my psychological wellness? So when I used to go to work, I used to make sure that I've got the right chair, the right table, um, that you offer us a gym in the building, I, w I worked in Dubai, so we did have a gym in the yoga <laughs> Not classes outside. early morning <laughs> on the 23rd floor, the yoga classes. Mm -hmm. You know, now that I'm at home, you, you know, what are you offering me? <laughs> <laughs> I, now that I'm at home, it's more about my psychological well-being. Okay, how's, how's, how's my brain coping with all of this madness that is out there? And, and, and then, you know, if you have three or four kids, you have madness inside as well. You need to deal with it. So, um, so all, all of this is a big impact, which as well, 
when we talk about diversity and inclusion, now that's a completely different, different subject because as we move, as we moved into completely uh, working remotely and a lot of companies now and businesses are thinking uh, about hybrid remote or full on remote for the adventurous ones, right? But then, then the next question is, if, if my people are working anywhere, uh, do I really uh, need them to be in my same geographical location? So then hiring somebody or, 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 or doing a role or, or, or a project becomes location agnostic. Doesn't really matter where you are in the world. You can just do the work for me as a business. Then you start thinking, so excellent. Does this um, enhance diversity and inclusion within my team? So then there is the, the, the additional element when it comes to diversity and inclusion, which is the cultural uh, uh, diversity element that comes into that, the innovation that comes with it, the infusion of fresh ideas and thoughts and, and, and experiences into my own team. So this is the, the positive impact of that. On the other side is, how much of training am I providing my own people to deal with the different new team members that are gonna pop in every once in a while on a contract or on a project basis? Um, what's, how, how, how is this gonna impact the team dynamic? Um, are they gonna think of this as a threat or are they gonna embrace it because it's part of their learning? because you know, there will be a transfer of knowledge as they are working with all of those different people from all around the world. And, 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 and funny enough, I was taking part in a conversation recently where somebody asked me that you as, as, an, as an online uh, uh, freelance platform for HR consultants, when you speak to CHROs or HR heads or HR managers and you tell them, you know, we can provide you with access to all of those independent contractors. Do they, do they feel threatened that one day they, they will not have, you know, like, like one day they won't have a job anymore. And I'm like, honestly, I cannot believe that <laughs> because I, I ideally, I would like to, to be able to reach out to strong, specialized people in order to strengthen the work that I'm doing for the business. So ideally, I should feel completely the opposite. Being a CHRO or, or a team leader with an HR, I should feel empowered because I have access to that many skills in order to deliver uh, at a certain level of quality uh, with, 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 with new ways of thinking that were not in the organization that are infused now with all of this innovation, etc. So I should feel empowered to bring in this multicultural, multi-skilled uh, 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 people into, into to my own environment. Um, so, so, so yes, it's, it's the, the, the current situation has been a big, uh, full of uncertainty. <laughs> but one thing actually is certain that there was a lot of disruption, but the one thing that everybody got disrupted is, is, is their own mindset, because then that's common, regardless of where, of where you are in the world. Disruption was in, 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 in our mindset, in, in our way of living, in our way of working. And we all got impacted in this. Uh, so hopefully something good will come out of that. But as, as Al said, there's a lot of work, groundwork to be done today. So now we need to go back to basics, but basics are remote, basics are virtual, basics are collaborative, on, online virtual collaborative environments. So, so yeah, that's, that's actually my take on this. If I could just build off that, and I'm putting the finishing touches on an article right now on organizational um, elasticity. So it also highlights individual and, and team elasticity. What the heck does elasticity mean? Um, is it just another synonym for agility? Uh, 
what I mean by elasticity is that can we flex as we need to over time uh, from an individual level? If I have eight hours to complete eight hours of work and something goes awry, my kid uh, has a tummy ache and I have to spend an hour you know, taking care of him or her. Now my eight hour day turned into seven. Now that one hour just what gets sacrificed either the work gets sacrificed or my well-being gets sacrificed that example times five days a week times you know 222 work days per year blows up real quick so we have done a horrible job uh creating elasticity in our own lives and organizationally and we have to be mindful of that how can we do that well we can leverage contractors we can have people who are experts who can do things faster with more uh, agility we can also uh, understand workload management like we talked about before at the end of the day I get really excited about what can be. I get really frustrated at the unwillingness of leaders to actually take that step. The good news is the pandemic, Black Lives Matter, the pursuit of social equity and justice in at least American society is pushing them towards that reality where people need to be appreciated for who they are um, and contractors aren't second-class citizens that are true collaborators with employees and that we have you know these means by which to understand is that too much you know the application of agile methodologies okrs all those things are providing better data into okay are things getting done on time how are people you know spending their time um, organizational network analysis has a role to play. Uh, you know, what's the frequency of communication, the amount of communication, the depth of the communication, all this stuff is now available. Is it being used systematically and ongoing to shed light on the worker experience? If so, great. If not, there's huge opportunity to do so. In fact, it doesn't cost that much money and the return is huge and i don't mean that to be hyperbole it, it, the benefits to individuals teams groups and organizations is unmistakable it's like the knowing doing gap that uh, dr jeffrey pfeffer talks about all the time the evidence is out there why the world isn't doing it in a greater degree is more of a question around human behavior and organizational uh, inertia than it is really about whether or not it's the right thing to do it is the right thing to do what I got excited again, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you like when you get excited. Uh, and and I'm, I'm hoping that one of you might be able to touch on the fact that, um, uh, like Emma said, there's a disruption um, with all of these different things, the pandemic, Black Lives really? Matter, <laughs> social justice reforms. And it seems that for a lot of companies, the HR professionals are the person the person or sins dealing with this disruption. They are the ones having to figure out how to be therapist, how to be coach, how to do all of those things and make all of these different people who are struggling with very real and different um, issues feel heard and valued and create that trust. Um, and I'm sure many of them were not trained for it in their HR degrees. <laughs> yeah. Is that something you all could touch on? Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's not easy. I mean, but uh, uh, it's um, that's a situation that all HR professionals found themselves in. I I, I fully agree with that. But we've asked for it, right? <laughs> so we've asked for a lot of uh, a lot of times that we want to be involved in a lot of things, and now suddenly, as the business is going through transformation you are at the same time transforming your own HR function. Uh, you're figuring out what, what, is, what is your remote work policy? Uh, what is the extent that you're gonna actually uh, fund uh, a home office? Um, how are you gonna take care of the well-being of your own people? What type of structures and fluid structures are you gonna have of now, from now on moving uh, forward? Um, you're going to be leveraging on you have to scale up and scale down because you, you 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 as a business you are more cost conscious today 
and you want to drive productivity, you want to be efficient, you want to bring in specialized people, but you cannot afford them full time. So you start bringing in contractors and independent consultants and how to plug them in. Uh, what does your structure look like to support your business? So it's sort of, we found ourselves in this situation where we are actually um, changing the tires as the car is running. And, and, and it's, 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 it's not an easy one. Um, so who's, who's training those HR people? And, and so today we are, we are planning for the future, but the future is today. So we used to, for example, as an, as an HR um, uh, uh, professional or a, 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 in an organization, you discuss in a meeting that, okay, guys, we need to implement a flexible work policy, for example, or we need to review our bonus scheme. And then you go, you sit with your team, you brief them, you work on that, etc. You put a proposal together, you take it to the, to the board or to the management or whatever. Today, you are, or you are applying it before you actually go do your, uh, uh, your, your, your review or your, you don't have time even to brainstorm and to make research, etc. So it's, it's not an easy situation. Um, and, and this is where I always stress that um, this comes with the, with, the, with, the, with the positive side of it is that today if we change our mindset, we are able to augment our team just like that by uh, getting support from specialists who will be able to help me to get things done quickly and in a cost efficient manner and the high quality. So actually it's, 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 it's all about me having that open, open mindset but open talent mindset as well that my team as an, as an, as an, as an HR person is not only the few people that I have working with me Actually, I can augment my team and get things done and, and rolling very, very quickly. Uh, that goes back to the collaborative environments that are out there, to the platforms that are out there, to the trust that come along with that uh, uh, interaction uh, that you, you know, you can get somebody to do all of that for you in a different time zone and then get it the next morning. So it's... Um, but what I mean by that is our approach as well needs to be different. Uh, so it's, it's not feeling limited, but actually there's, there's much more abundance today. We have, we have access. We always had, but we didn't, we didn't, we didn't change our mindset. Today that we are forced to, uh, we need to feel that abundance of, of, of skills that are out there. Your, your, your talent pool became very global, but it's became as well very small because it's a couple of clicks away from you. Yeah. If I might just jump in, uh, Kelly, I know we're coming up on time. Thank you, Emma, because uh, I want to pick up on one thing you said. I, I believe organizational leaders need to humanize the work experience and HR needs to facilitate that into reality. They need to bring it into reality. And that's a tough job. It's a tough job on a, the best days under previous times, uh, increasingly difficult under uh, the current situation. I do, however, believe uh, HR professionals are up for it. I don't okay. like the term HR business partner. Uh, I don't, <laughs> don't get me started on that uh, because it focuses too much on the, the business. It's an and between the humanizing, the work experience and advocating for the business. It's a tough job for anybody. Where I will say is that if there is a better understanding of the human experience, that what they need to be uh, seen, heard, and empowered, then they can do their job more effectively. I see many HR professionals and organizational leaders flying blind or close to blind because they don't have the requisite data. They don't have the understanding of what actually is happening. And that is now a leader decision. The tools are there, the data is there, the insights are there. They just have to prioritize it and make it happen. Thank you for that. And uh, I have a question from the uh, audience that is on this point. Um, what are you seeing as effective measurement of well-being? I get your point about asking, how are you doing? 
but that, not, that might not be actionable or specific enough. What about passive data collection on wellness, on well-being? Seeing any, are you seeing anything there? Uh, you mind if I take that, Emma, real quick? Yes, you go ahead. So uh, I'm going to shamelessly promote, uh, if you go to bennybutton.com, uh, they have a construct that I'm a huge advocate of. I've contributed to it, so I definitely have that bias. Uh, but they talk uh, about capacity and capability. So in other words, if you have uh, a good well-being and you're contributing in the way that you want to and the organization wants to, to that's a good way of uh, moving forward. If, however, any of those other dimensions are compromised, you're not contributing, you're not well, even though you might be contributing, then your well-being is, is going to get uh, compromised. Well-being, by its very nature, is a self-assessment. Um, the challenge with self-assessments are creating the safe environment by which to answer authentically. In other words, if you're not doing okay, there has to be the space to say that you're not okay. And then it invites the question, should that data be the uh, privy of the, of the ownership of the individual? So it's just a tool for them to measure and monitor how they move forward, or is it gonna be something that's gonna to go to the organization? And if it goes to the organization, much like engagement surveys, is it gonna be seven or 10 people and above so they can actually do analysis um, kind of the metadata. So yeah, it's, there's no uh, perfect answer uh, to that, but at the end of the day, there are a variety of means in which to get at it. Um, I would really be thoughtful around the surrounding constructs as well. So it's not well-being in isolation. Um, it could be, again, contribution and capacity is what I uh, talk to a lot, um, echoing to what Stephen Rice, uh, who is formerly at Juniper Networks, who's now at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation talks about. He talks about four C's, uh, capacity, contribution, connection, and capability. Did I say those right? I, I don't think I was redundant. They all started with C, yeah. so they must be right. Yeah, so, <laughs> so, so uh, but, but yeah, the, the, uh, I could get more specific. Uh, you feel free to reach out me, to me directly because uh, there's a variety of like specific survey questions and clustering of questions that you could ask, but that's uh, too detailed yeah. for this conversation. Emma? Yeah, so I, I wanted to say that the check-ins actually could either be tech-related uh, or it could be just a normal human check-in. Uh, then you, 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 get, you get back to that point, or am I creating that safe environment to have that honest, open discussion? Uh, and if we don't have that safe environment, then it's a waste of time. There are tools out there. We do have access to one of the tools, which is more um, a, a culture forensics tools uh, that does those check-ins and does the behavioral uh, uh, analysis in the background uh, that um, gives you access or a view on um, how's your team doing. Um, but then again, you know, data is as good as the benchmarks that are out there. And there's, there's, there's not much yet that are out there given the current situation that we are in, because it's, it's a different animal that we are dealing with in terms of pressure that, uh, that is out there. So Brene Brown speaks a lot about vulnerability in leadership. And it sounds mm -hmm. like that's what you both are saying, just creating opportunities where both the employee can be vulnerable and also where the employer, the management shows vulnerability in the right times. Yeah, and it's a tricky balance because um, I, I love uh, Brainy Brown and I will pronounce her name properly at some point in my life. It's not gonna be today, unfortunately. Uh, but what I will say is <clears throat> in this remote work environment, it's great to have, again, eight meetings a day and the 30 minutes and each meeting say, hey, how are you doing? Well, you can either, I am doing fine and just move on. Or you can say, you know what? I'm really struggling today. And so now if I'm having eight meetings asking that same question, now I'm holding space for eight people and the time that I have to actually do work goes down. And my, if I'm on the other side and I'm sharing, 
am I going to share that in each and every meeting? So there is some realities that need to be appreciated when we are vulnerable. We have to choose our spots, in other words, and we got to choose who to be vulnerable to uh, when it's appropriate. It's a tough balance. Um, I struggle with it personally. Uh, because you know, I want to be truthful to everybody, but sometimes I'm like, you know, I'm not going to open up right now. I got 85 things to do, so I, I got to plow through, and that's just you know the, the reality. So the timing, appreciating the constraints of reality, are are things we need to do, and for organizations, we need to do it at scale, which is tough. Yeah. Right. Um, and uh, I think we could talk about this point forever, but for the sake of time. I will probably need to wrap things up fairly soon. Um, would uh, would either of you like to touch on the uh, paid performance module that we're in now before we wrap up? We've kind of touched on it a little bit um, throughout some of the other points. I yeah no I would say that uh, pay, uh, the whole notion of pay is going to change very soon <laughs> because we've we've always paid for roles and the complexity of the role etc. But uh, today, if, if with, the, with the way things are going and we are actually shifting more towards output and, and, and then projects, and uh, then you start, if you take a step back and you think, okay, then how am I going to compensate my people from a pay perspective? Um, then that's the whole idea of setting the, the actual pay um, and is it is it is the pay relevant to the contribution, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, per project? How am I going to value that project, etc.? So, and this, and we see a lot of our clients actually struggling uh, of 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 attaching a value or a budget to a to a project because they are not used to it. Usually, they just reach out to a consultant, and the consultant comes back with a pro with a with a proposal. But today, if I am going to put a project out there with my own budget, uh, I, I struggle to, as a client, for example, to set what is the budget for the project. Um, but then on, on, on pay for performance, uh, it's, I'm not sure when we're talking about establishing pay for performance, it's in, in my world, it has always been there. <laughs> so it's, it's not a new notion. It's just it's going to take a new, uh, uh, a, a, a new, a different twist to today. So, uh, and and we're seeing this for, for example, in in in, in mining companies here in South Africa, gold mining companies, the share price of the gold is skyrocketing, and companies are making uh, uh, um, their their value is going up, but their 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 bonus schemes <laughs> are, are, are hit. So the, their people are actually not gonna get bonuses this year. So then this is when you think like, what are, is it the performance of the company, my own performance, what have I done? So there's a lot of, a lot of uh, background thinking that needs to happen. Yeah, the, and I go back to the legacy thinking and our unwillingness to uproot from where we've been. And hopefully this disruption, this disruption uh, with COVID-19 will accelerate innovation in this regard. Uh, there's a couple of things. I have a TAD framework, a talent assessment and development framework, which I advocate um, as a thinking model to, to start from. It has 10 dimensions. Um, I won't go through those 10 right now. I will come back to the Stephen Rice uh, four dimensions of capability, uh, contribution, connection, and uh, capacity. The thing is that I, I'm willing to pay for that. I, I'm willing to pay for contribution. I can give a rat's yeah. tail on what's a, on a job description, what someone's responsible for. I want to pay for what they've actually done. done. If they have exactly. connections that add value, the relationship equity, both internally and externally, that's a, a value. Their capacity, you know, to enable to be there on demand as needed and get work done, that's a, a value. And their skill set. So, you know, those things that are assets that I'm willing to, as a leader, to, to pay for. Historically, we've looked at the external market and that's been the guide of, you know, a position uh, to Emma's point, you know, that's how we thought about comp. And uh, don't get me started. I mean, because now there's ethical ramifications per gender, per diversity groups that are 
being perpetuated based on the this historical thinking. So I'm really for disrupting uh, pay for performance. I don't like the word performance. I wrote an article that I stand by years ago called performance management is stupid. Yeah, so you can tell, you know, how I alienated a lot of people. It's like, yeah. I just don't like it. I, I, I just, uh, I don't believe it's true. And there's research that's 20 years old now that shows that performance appraisal d disengage not only the person being reviewed, but the reviewer, him or herself. Yes. And we're, st you know, don't get me started on rankings, you know, so, and force distributions and all this other stuff. Um, so, yeah, I, I think we really have, I mean, we've been talking about, I'm now getting in danger of being an old cynical man, but we've been talking about this for a long, long time. I'm talking yeah. 15, 20 years, and we still have not moved the needle significantly. I could put on, you know, maybe just on my two hands, the companies that have truly innovated around pay and performance and contribution and all that, Stephen Rice being one of them. Uh, but as we have a long way to go. So that's a great opportunity is would be the key, key takeaway. Yeah. Yeah, not my favorite topic as well. <laughs> not my favorite. We get excited yeah, for the wrong no. reasons. Yeah. yeah, it's 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 yeah, funny enough right, as well right. when 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 the current situation uh, when we talk about essential services and then you start thinking you can't live without those people. When you talk about about contribution and then when you look at, look at their level of pay and they are they are essential service and then you start thinking then why well, why are they they are paid the lowest among all the other roles that are out there. So who sets pay and what actually drives it? And, 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 then, and, then, and then, yeah, this whole notion of performance appraisals and performance discussions and is, um, um, I, I've never been a fan. Yeah. And it's, I just uh, heard th this morning and Nike has really stepped into the Black Lives Matter movement, which I think is a great thing. And I heard uh, one of their strategies or thinking behind it was that they are marketing to the next 30 years of customers, not the previous 30 years. And it just dawned on me just now our performance systems have been for the last 30 years, not for the yes. next 30 years. Because young people, yeah, well, young people want to be, hey, I, I'll contribute this, pay me. In fact, I'm one of the best in the world at this. That person who's been here 30 years doesn't know a damn thing about Instagram marketing, and I am a rock star, so pay me. <laughs> you know, so, you know, we have this... Um, uh, kind of, okay, you know, check the box mentality. I often say I grew up in the suck it up generation. You're lucky to have a job. You're being told what to do. Just do it. You know, this is how it is. And younger people are going, uh, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if, if they're high value talent, they got options, you know, and they can go on Upwork and say, well, no, you're going to pay me 20 bucks. I can get paid 50 bucks, you know, so. Yeah. You know, so yeah, it's a new reality and that's a good thing. And that, I know that goes into Emma's wheelhouse in terms of her business. Yeah. As, as someone who will be in the job market for the next 30 years, I'm very, I'm very hopeful <laughs> that that's where we're going. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll share this video afterwards. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, guys, I think we need to wrap it up time wise. Um, are there, uh, and, and open it to question and answers from the audience. Are there any other questions that um, are coming through or any other, uh, whoops, any other things that you all would like to share? Sorry about that. I'll just say this. I mean, Emma, it's been great talking with you, uh, you know, learning from you. And uh, I don't know if I'm going to be in South Africa anytime soon. But mm -hmm. if your husband is a surfer, he's welcome here in Santa Cruz with you and your daughter anytime. So just uh, <laughs> let me know when that might happen. Thanks. Thanks all. Yeah, I, it was a pleasure really to to have this chat and and then to learn from you, really. I uh, Likewise. Uh, it's, it's exciting times. <laughs> it is. It is. And, and they're with, with, rooted with great opportunity. Uh, it, it is, yes. you know, tragic uh, in many ways. And it's, uh, but I, I believe uh, much like is happening politically here in the United States, uh, there's a lot of youth engagement. There's 
people who are saying this has not worked historically, therefore we're going to move forward in a different way. Uh, that's happening politically, it's happening organizationally. Um, so I hope, I hope we truly take advantage of this opportunity and it's going to happen, I think, because there are people like you, Emma, and, and Will, who have an assertive voice who are advocating for uh, new, more innovative approaches. So I, I remain hopeful, um, but there is no shortage of work to be done, that's for sure. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I look forward to the time when businesses wanna go back to, to working uh, in, in enough physical office space and the people will say, no, it makes, actually it makes yeah. no sense to me. Why, why would I do that? I've, right. I've, I've, I've done everything while I was at home or virtually, then why I don't want, I actually don't want to go back to the office. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I, I, I foresee, and you know, this is another thing I'm going to start exploring. I mumbled <laughs> that pretty severely. This is something <laughs> that I'm uh, exploring is what does a future state of return to workplace look like? Uh, is it yes. going back to these big mega uh, complexes and offices, or are we going to have more satellite offices like uh, Upwork? Not, uh, I'm not Upwork, uh, uh, WeWork. So yes. not WeWork per se, uh, but satellite offices that maybe bring um, pods of workers or teams together um, to you know, collaborate, to share resources, but on a organizational um, a property, if you will, not just yes. uh, a third More party's of a property. hybrid approach. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Right. Yeah, just yeah. to stimulate uh, uh, um, uh, creativity and, and then uh, to beef yeah. up the collaboration between them. And with all due respect, being a parent of two kids, to get away from the house and yeah, get, yeah. get with some adults. No, I hear you, I hear you. <laughs> yeah. 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 I hear that a lot. But, but we'll see, but we will well, see. So, um, Just to close, I will, my favorite quote actually from today's session was from Al uh, and it's, organizational leaders need to humanize work experience and HR is responsible for bringing that to reality. I think uh, that is just really sums up where we're at. The spot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what needs to happen. Um, and yeah, I just thank you all both uh, for being here and for the participants. Um, we will send a blueprint of all the information and things that we discussed today. So you will have um, a slightly more tangible um, summary of today's session. Well, I like uh, Emma's quotes better, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Which one? <laughs> the, the neuroscience one. The, the neuroscience uh, one, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I have a few so, pages of those too. They were yeah. a little harder to recite, so. <laughs> yeah, right. No, I'm, I'm kidding. It's, it, it's been a true pleasure speaking with you both. Thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, please be well. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Enjoy guys. Enjoy the rest of your days or evenings.